You can see? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, the, dia uh, the data and the idea. Um, um, okay. Now, okay. Uh, the data and the idea I have presented are part of our research uh, that in the last eight years focused on water, water management, and waterscapes. This was funded uh, by two projects, one still ongoing. Uh, at the same time, two international conferences on water management in the ancient Near East were organized. Um, their partial results have been published in the monographic issue of water history edited by uh, Lucia Mori in 2020, which is particularly relevant for the topic of uh, this conference. Uh, my paper today will deal with evidence from Sumerian written sources, uh, mostly economic and literary texts. In uh, discussing these sources, I will stick with the Sumerian terminology in order to provide anemic perspective on the matter. This, of course, will diverge from modern terminologies and scientific categories, which have been the focus of this conference. Most of the speakers and uh, are geologists or something similar <laughs> from my point of view, uh, or archaeologists who have a long acquaintance with geological and hydrogeological analysis, which I lack completely. Thus, I start apologizing for my proper use of some terms. Um, the Sumerian lexicon distinguishes three main body of water or waterscapes. The E or Id, uh, rivers and canals, Ab or Ayaba, the sea, and the Ambar. In my presentation, I will briefly discuss the canals and the sea. The first because it has been extensively treated in Assyriological literature, the second for the lack of evidence. I will give instead more space to the Ambar that received limited um, attention in the past. The rivers and canals are the source of life of four Sumerian cities. They determine the everyday activities and have an important impact in cultural and religious ideas. Canals were created to control the flood, drain marshes, manage uh, irrigation, and travel from one city to the other. Large urban settlements were crossed by canals. Temples and palaces have uh, each their own quay where boats were moored, transporting goods, people, and even gods. The crucial role of the canal network is widely documented in the written sources. An idea of the evidence from the administrative texts has been offered by Stephanie Rost yesterday. yesterday. Here, I will focus on the royal inscriptions and literature to highlight the relationship between canals, civilization, and rulership. Digging canal is one of the first cosmogonic acts in Sumerian, in Sumerian myth, as shown in Enki and Nimach, where after the creation of the cosmos, the minor gods are obliged to dig the canals and they suffer. This motif is found in the Akkadian Atrakasis as well. In both myths, work is identified with canal digging. These are the necessary premises for the development of civilization. According to another text, the rulers of Lagash, after the deluge, a new humanity made to last was created. This humanity continues to share traits of the preceding one. People continues to have a long lasting life, 200 years, and live in a primitive condition. The necessary premises for development and civilization being not yet introduced. Again, digging and maintaining the canals system is the first and main topic. Thus, in the Sumerian perspective, agriculture is the natural consequence of creation and maintenance of canals network. This is the first 
uh, act necessary for the civilization. Canals allow the life of the country and produce food. As a consequence, famine is directly related to the decay of the canal network. To build and to clean canals is the main responsibility and concern of the ruler who bears the title canal inspector, a title which is shared with some specific gods. As civilization is created by digging the canals, crisis periods and periods of anarchy are marked by the literary topic of the abandoned canals network. This idea is paralleled by royal inscriptions commemorating the dig of canals. It should be noted that in comparison with his successors, the founders of new dynasty are the most active in this task by far. A good example is that of Urnanche uh, and uh, that of Urnamma, the founder of the first dynasty of Lagash and the third dynasty of Ur, respectively. In their inscriptions, they commemorate the digging of several canals. The, effort of, uh, the efforts of Urnamma are widely celebrated in literature. If the rulers of Lagash assigns the digging of multiple canals to Urnanche's unknown predecessor, because he's broken the passage before, um, um, before the name of this uh, um, king bil, uh, digging all these uh, canals. On the contrary, uh, in the hymn known as Urnamma, the canal digger, the ruler self praises his activity as canal digger. This shows that the base of the centralized power is the control and maintenance of the canals. As for the sea, textual references are scanty, and this has uh, led scholars such as Edza to attribute, uh, attribute this absence to the fact that ancient Mesopotamia was a river civilization. While we can't deny this assumption for the historical periods, we must record, on the contrary, the relevance of the Gulf in early Sumer and a decreasing of importance of the sea during the third millennium. In fact, the earliest uh, uh, Sumer civilization, I don't like this term, but it's conventional, rises on the seashore and is projected towards the sea. Sumer is part of a cultural and commercial network interesting the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean, and of which Southern Mesopotamian is the terminal and not the center. The main foreign partners, partners of Sumer uh, in these early uh, periods are the three overseas countries, Tilmun, Magan, and Melukka. In literary sources, these three countries have gained a mythical status. This is particularly true for Dilmun. Its foundation is celebrated at the beginning of the myth Enki and uh, Kursanga, and is uh, even called the Emporium of Sumer. Furthermore, the Sumerian Noah, Tsusudra, is settled in Dilmun after the deluge. The literary echo of the primeval relationship of Sumer with Dilmun, Magan, and Melukka is supported by royal inscriptions and administrative texts. The epigraphic and archaeological sources record, on the other uh, hand, the connections and the change of power balance in the Gulf. On the other, the crisis and the decadence of this system. This may be due to several unrelated factors the decay of the Gulf branch of a larger network, the interests of Mesopotamian rulers toward the Northern regions, etc. A related cause or effect is the collapse of the canal network and the return to marshes of large areas. By the mid third millennium, the sea is not a space of communication anymore, but a border. The exhaustion of the relationships with the Gulf are witnessed in archaeological and epigraphical evidence. 
as for the latter, references to Dilmun, Magan, and Meluka are drastically reduced along the third millennium. The references to Dilmun in the Sumerian administrative texts are 10 in over 40,000 known documents. In the royal inscriptions, the periodical restoration of the contacts with the, these regions and the ephemeral military ventures of the Akkadian kings showed the, the decay of the network and the failure of Mesopotamian rulers to keep permanent relationship with the overseas countries. In a broad sense, the sea becomes a mythical and political border. The sea or the river of salty water is the border between the land of the livings and that of the dead. In the royal inscription, the known world, that is to say the totality over which the Mesopotamian kings claim their rulership is confined between two seas, the upper and the lower, being the latter, the Persian Gulf. Now going to um, the Ambar, which is my main uh, uh, focus in this paper, um, and here you have the ideogram for uh, Ambar, which is a, a, a water enclosed, uh, so it's a body of water, clo or closed body of water. The Sumerian term Ambar is usually and conventionally translated as marsh. However, it is clear that it refers to different body of water, such as swamp, marshes, and lagoons, and even moat, as we will see. For this reason, I prefer to maintain the Sumerian term ambar as far as possible. Literary passages, in fact, describe what an ambar was in the Sumerian emic perspective. In the debate Ho and Plow, the ambar is the result of a water cause outbreak when a canal or ditch is cut. In another debate, winter, winter and summer, the ambar is produced by the encounters of the floods, waters, and the sea. In a mythical perspective, is the god of the sweet underground waters, Enki, who create the ambars together with the rivers and canals. And it is under his patronage and that of the goddess Nanshe that fear, fish and birds thrive in the ambar. This reveals to be an important source of food with bird, fish, shellfish, uh, small mammals, and etc., raw materials, and of course, water. The administrative texts, particularly from Lagash area, provide evidence for the exploitation of ambars and its products. But this has been underestimated until recent studies by scholars such as Angela Grego and Noemi Borrelli. Uh, literary sources, on the other hand, emphasize the function of the ambars and its crucial role in the everyday and economic uh, activities. Far from being a remote and alien place, the ambar is part of the cityscape of the Sumerian settlements. The, for example, the beginning of the Aaron and the Tartals provides a list of cities and their ambar or marshes. These cities are Tutub, Akshak, Giritab, and Ur. The latter, being the capital of the Neo-Sumerian kingdom, is extensively mentioned in literary texts uh, where the relationship of the city and its temple at the Ekish Nungal with the ambar is often stressed. Other Sumerian cities were encircled or provided by an ambar. Uh, the vast ambar of Eridu is uh, extensively celebrated in literature. Administrative texts from Girsu record uh, several ambars, which interestingly are drastically reduced to few references in Umma documents. Even the documents from Nippur, few and mostly related to non-central administration, inform us of the existence of a marsh, the little Banda uh, Ambar of Nippur. 
I'm sorry, uh, I just skip a slide. Um, the first passage in this slide leads us to the mutual uh, relationship the city has with the surrounding uh, Ambar. Uh, this is an important source of products, water and defense, as we will see for the city. But urbanistic and the economic reasons lead to the drainage of marshes or ambars, as briefly shown by the reference in Lugalbanda and the Anzu bird in relation with the city of Uruk. More detailed are the two royal inscriptions of Urnamma and Gungunum. Uh, in the uh, 21st century, Urnamma, founder of the third dynasty of Ur, drains a large ambar around Ur and creates an agricultural area of 200 33 square kilometers and creates a levy of 45 kilometers. One century after, Gungunum, ruler of Larsa, literally takes out his city from the marsh and provides it with walls. This process, however, is uh, reversible. Canals and rivers may be diverted to feed the ambar around the city as the above mentioned Isini Dinam's inscription shows. This takes us to a further aspect related to the Ambar and the city. In ancient Mesopotamian warfare, the control of water is crucial. As an offensive act, enemies may break the canal and flood the plain, may divert the water course and invest the city or drain the marshes and thus cut the supply of water for the city. The excesses of water, few or too much and in an uh, improper time, that is the lack of control over it, is the cause or effect of the destruction brought by enemies. In Sumerian lamentation texts over the destruction of the Southern Mesopotamian cities at the end of the Urtri dynasty, the vast ambar of Eridu is now dried and can be walked through. On the contrary, Uruk is flooded and transformed in an ambar. Uh, not only canals and rivers work as borders, um, but marshes and swamps may have defensive functions as well. This is clearly stated in two old Babylonian inscriptions from Amurabi and its successor, Samsuiluna. In these cases, the term Ambar has been perhaps improperly translated as Mot. Unfortunately, we don't have images that support the role played by water uh, in warfare, but we can recall the Near Syrian king's complaint uh, about flooding and marshes during the Babylonian campaign when the Chaldeans flee and hide in the marshes created by the flood instead of fighting in open fields. And in a modern parallel, the similar problem faced, faced by the British army in the Mesopotamian campaign during the World War I. Before the conclusion, I would like to draw your attention to the limited Sumerian lexical repertoire uh, related to water. The term A ah is used for water and all, any other liquid, as for example, the semen. There is no difference between a natural or an artificially, uh, artificial water course, since the term E or uh, ID, that is E7, means both river and canal. Similarly, the term ambar refers to different body of water, such as marshes, lagoons, uh, swamps, etc. Finally, the term of C, uh, for C shows an ambiguity since we find two terms, ab and ayab, ayaba, uh, literally meaning water of ab, which are alternating and interchangeable. Beside this elemental uh, division, it should be mentioned that the terminology for secondary, secondary waterways and structures related to the canal, uh, canals and the irrigation system is well articulated. In conclusion, according to the text, and thus in the Mesopotamian scribes' perspective, the dominant element in landscape is water. 
rivers and canals cross and connect cities and feed the ambars that mix their waters with the sea. Besides treated separately, the rivers canals network, ambars and sea are part of our in an interconnected system whose seasonal changes determine the life and activity of local communities. The human struggle for the control and regulation of water mold social and economic behaviors and cultural and religious ideas. The survival of the communities depends uh, directly on the, uh, to the, on the success or failure of water control. The ruler as head of the community is the main responsibility responsible of it. Thank you. Thank you to Lorenzo Volterame for this uh,